All right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up the fish lecture here. Uh, we talked about cartilaginous fish or chondrichthys in the previous lecture, and then we were talking about the bony fish and looking at kind of the key things that make bony fish different from cartilaginous fish also in that previous lecture. So let's just get this wrapped up. Um, phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, and then the bony fish. Uh, again, they evolve around 400 million years ago, and we see skeletons of bone, the swim bladder, which gives them the buoyancy, and that operculum that covers their gills and helps pump water. Um, one big, one other, let me put one other significant difference between bony fish and cartilaginous fish. In general, bony fish have a much greater um, reproductive potential than cartilaginous fish. So you put a shark next to this spotted drum or the, the spotted drum here, shark might only have one or two babies, spotted drum might lay 3,000 eggs. Or think about bluegill or bass or catfish, if you guys are familiar with those guys. How many hundreds of eggs do they lay? So when we get into conservation and ecology, there's a huge difference between bony fish and cartilaginous fish when it comes to reproductive potential, uh, restoration plans. I want to rebuild a, a bluegill population. Give me two years and 10 fish and I can have you have thousands of bluegill. I can't do that with sharks. It might take me decades because of the reproductive cycle and what we call the life history. Significantly different with cartilaginous fish. Um, we also will see cartilaginous fish, marine. Don't know of a cartilaginous fish that could live in Lake Springfield. Yet bony fish, marine, and freshwater. Plenty of bony fish in Lake Springfield. That's all we have in that lake are fish that we would call bony fish. Now within the bony fish, we will split this group into two kind of broad categories. The first category are the ray-finned fish. These are going to be fish that have bony fins. So again, bluegill, bass, crappie, etc. And those bony fins are controlled by muscles in the body. So they can move the fins around, they can propel themselves. They have this muscle muscular control of the bony fins that enables them to swim and perform their life functions. So again, that's the group we call the ray finned fish. The second group within the bony fish will be the lobe finned fish. Now lobe finned fish have muscle and bone within the fin. So it's, it's structurally different. So here on ray finned, the, uh, let me make this a little smaller. On a ray finned fish, for those of you, you're not that familiar with them, let's say that is the fin, or the, you have these, uh, sorry, let me make this darker. Um, on a ray finned fish, let's say that's one of the fins, you have these bony projections. And then everything in between here, this is thin, it's tough and pretty durable, but it's this thin skin in there. We go down to our lobe finned fish and you look at their fins. You got a fin there. There's actually bone structures within the fin. And then in between the bone, let's make the muscle red, there is muscle attachment. So it's a very, very different structure. That muscle attachment enables a much different movement of the fin. Uh, there's a cool little video here. Again, the hyperlinks were working when I set everything up. 
I hope they still work. If they don't, please let me know and I'll try to find a substitute as quick as possible. Um, but this is actually a catfish that's walking across the ground. It's going from one puddle to the next puddle. There's tons of videos out there. Don't just YouTube it or if you YouTube it, look at the source. Go with something like National Geographic or a valid source, not just Tom's page on fish. But find something that's valid and there's tons of fish species that we call walking fish. They typically have lobed fins. This is the group that gave rise to the amphibians are the lobe finned fish. Amphibians did not evolve from uh, ancestor to a bass or a bluegill or a crappie. They evolved from an ancestor of the walking fish. So you look at these ancestral lobe finned fish, compare them to the early ancestral amphibian, not a huge, huge difference. Yes, there is some structural differences, but it's not this massive evolutionary leap to go from one thing to the next, to go from lobe finned to ancestral amphibian. So when people argue against evolution and say, well, a fish can't turn into an amphibian, show them these pictures and say, how big of a difference is there? How come this can't make that small evolutionary step over the course of, oh, maybe a hundred million years to evolve towards an ancestral amphibian? So, all right, so check it out. Take a look at it. This takes care of the fish, the kind of the intro to the phylum or the phylum chordata and the vertebrata, uh, also the urochordata and the cephalochordata and all the fish. The other lectures over Amphibians and, amphibians and reptiles, birds and mammals will be other PowerPoints. And I, ju I just wanted to separate it out so they're not massive two and a half hour PowerPoints for you guys. So, but check those out as well. And we'll keep walking through the deuterostome. Last thing to leave you with, see if you can do this from the top of your head. What is the key feature to distinguish a deuterostome versus a protostome? Actually, there's two big key features. Do you remember those? If you don't, write it down, deutero versus proto, look up those features.